Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning again to you all, church. Thanks for being with us in worship today. Uh, As I mentioned earlier, my name is Ben. I'm on staff here at Trinity. Uh, It's my privilege and pleasure to get to share the word with you this morning. A special welcome and just a a, a recognition of dads out there today. Happy Father's Day to you. Uh, Mindful also of grandpas and great-grandpas and uncles and cousins and men in our life uh, who have been an influence to us, over us, a witness to us uh, of who Jesus is. Um, Also mindful of, of men that have wanted to be dads and for one reason or another haven't been able to. Uh, We think of you today as well uh, and are mindful of the beauty of adoption and uh, the sovereignty of God even when his plans are not what we want or not what we like, uh, not what we have planned for us. Uh, It's an opportunity perhaps for us to lean in to each other and to him and to trust Uh, that he is good and his plans for us are good for us. So just special welcome and and special thanks to the men in our lives uh, who help make our lives special. Grateful for them. Um, Yeah, I'm the director of youth ministry here, so I spend a lot of time with teenagers. Uh, Grateful to get an opportunity to preach the word to you this morning. If you haven't been with us, uh, we're doing a summer series on the book of Psalms called Summer Playlist. Uh, We started a couple weeks ago with Psalm 23, perhaps the most well-known psalm, both in the church and outside of the church. Last week, uh, Brian Follett shared with us uh, a psalm of ascent, uh, which was beautiful, and I'm making it easy on you. It's June 16th, so guess which psalm we're doing today, Isaiah? Psalm 16, yeah, they got, they got it. Okay, you could, it's obvious, right? It's so obvious you're afraid to share the answer because you're like, I don't know, what if I'm wrong? No, it's, it's Psalm 16, really simple. That's, that's what we're doing, June 16th. It's Psalm 16. Before we get there, I want to set this up a little bit. This is a song about blessing God because he's trustworthy. Because we can place our trust in God, we have reason to rejoice and be confident and be glad and sing and all those things. So I want to set this up by sharing with you that I'm a really trusting person. Those of you who know me, know that about me, like too trusting, okay? Like, I think the word for that is gullible. Um, I think at one point in time, I think I was in high school, somebody told me, hey, did you know you can spell gullible, P-U-R-P-L-E? And I was like, you can? Like, that, like, like I'm that trusting. I'm that easily uh, persuaded, I guess you can say. I'm a, I'm a very trusting person. Here's some things that I put my trust in. Here's some people I put my trust in. I trust my furnace in the wintertime because I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, and this is southern Canada to me, right? Like... <laughs> Like, please, 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 furnace work, okay? Like, I trust that thing to keep, keep our house warm. I trust the air conditioner in the summertime to keep us cool, although I'd be fine without an air conditioner because 85 and sticky is way better than 115 and dry. But that's just me. I trust my pickup to get me where I need to go. Every day, I trust my office chair to hold my weight while I sit in it and do things on the computer for teenagers. I trust less and less every day, but I still trust our minivan that's 23 years old and and is really rusty, although that's probably the thing I should trust in is the rust, right? Like I know like death and taxes and rust, like those are inevitable. We trust that those are coming for all of us. Um, I still trust the van somewhat. Um, I trust churches. Most of the time, that's been good. Sometimes, That's burned me or hurt me. Or I've heard stories, listened to examples where people put their place in, put their trust in a place like church or people like Christians and it hasn't worked out well. Like that's happened to me too, right? Because churches are made of people and people are sinful, ultimately we can trust them to a point but then they will let us down 
But I trust in churches. I trust in leaders of churches. It's very easy for me to do that. I trust in politicians. And I'm mindful of that because this is an election year. It's easy for me to trust because they sound so polished and the promises seem good and it's like, yeah, this will be great for my family. This will be good for the country. I'm in, right? Like it's, it's so easy for me to put my trust in leaders and politicians and people like that. Even though I've experienced a lack of that trust or a betrayal of that trust. I trust in my wife, that she's a good partner for me, that we'll do this thing together. I trust in myself to be a good husband to her, to be able to raise our kids together, to be a good employee of this church, a good staff member. I trust in my own abilities to do different things. I'm not going to ask you to share because a third of you are introverts, um, but I do want you to take 30 seconds and think about the people and the things in which you place trust. I've shared some examples from my life. 30 seconds. Who do you trust in? What do you trust in? Is it your vehicle, your home, your community, one of your pastors? Is it in your bank account, your possessions, your skills or your strength? What are the things that you place your trust in? Who are the people that you place your trust in? I think Psalm 16 has something for us this morning. Something about trust and the outcomes of our trust, the outcomes of the assumptions that we can make. I think Psalm 16 has something to say to us this morning. So I want to jump into the text now, invite you to open your Bible or get on your phone, pull out your app. Psalm 16, I'm going to read the whole psalm, just 11 verses here. Uh, but we'll read through it together. I'm reading out of the NRSV this morning. The words should be on the screens behind me. You're welcome to follow along there as well uh, or follow along uh, in the Bible you have in front of you. Psalm 16, starting in verse 1. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good part, uh, I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me, and because he's at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol, or let your faithful one see the pit. You show me the path of life, in your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now David begins this psalm. David is the author of the psalm. Uh, he's the king of Israel at this, at this time. He begins the psalm by asking God to protect him or preserve him or keep him safe. David takes refuge in God, so it follows that David, uh, excuse me, that God would preserve David. Notice that the request itself 
assumes a level of trust here. Like David is asking God to do this because there's a relationship there. David is asking God to do this because David assumes that God's going to deliver, right? David wouldn't ask if he didn't think that God could come through for him. And, and we, we know this because of the three things that follow immediately after David says, protect me. Then he says, I take refuge in you. Like, like David has experienced this already in, in God. Like that, that's been his experience, his relationship with God is that God is a protector. God is a preserver. God can take care of me. And then he says in verse two, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, right? So David can make this request because he's submitted himself to God. Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, is God. He is protector, preserver, keeper. This is who God is to David, and so he can make this request. And then David says something that I think is like theologically awesome. Look at the end of verse two. I have no good apart from you. Man, I need that reminder sometimes. I can struggle with pride and arrogance. I can think my stuff doesn't stink. I feel really self-sufficient, like I'm a self-made man. And there's so much in our culture, especially in Western culture and American culture, there's so much that pushes us to do that, right? To live that way. Even if you are insecure about who you are and your giftings, our culture is telling us, no, you are enough, you are good, go do this. The only reason why you don't have is because you haven't done yet, right? Just try harder, work harder, go faster, do all these things. Make it all happen yourself. And David admits at the beginning of this psalm, I have no good apart from you. There is nothing in me that's good. Like, like that's good, maybe not theology, that's good anthropology, right? Like, let's understand who we are as fallen human beings. Yes, we're precious. Yes, we're chosen. Yes, we're beautiful and we're made in the image of God. And when God made us, there was perfection and we're born into this sinful nature. It's called original sin because our first parents, Adam and Eve, made a choice. Now we inherit this kind of nature that is against God, is for self. We have to understand that. Such a good statement for for David to make. So these are the reasons why he can ask God to protect him and preserve him because he's found protection in God, because he's submitted himself to God, and because David knows that without God, he's nothing. He has no good thing. Some of the commentators I consulted while thinking through this passage said that this is a a plea or a, a request that's made without anxiety. It's made without impatience, which I think is interesting to think about, like, like what kind of trust do you have to have? What kind of relationship do you have to have to make a request like this and not be anxious about it? Peter reminds us of this in, in the New Testament, right? Do not, do not be anxious about anything, but in, in everything, by prayer and petition, submit your requests to, to the Lord, to Jesus, and, and he will answer, right? Like, David makes this without anxiety. It's because David is confident in God's ability. He seeks help in no other source because his source, capital S, is completely adequate. It's verse one and two. David switches gears a little bit He speaks about two groups of people, and I want you to notice the labels that David gives these two groups of people. Verse three, he talks about one group, and then verse four, he talks about another group. So if you still have a finger in Psalm 16, if you're still looking at the text, go back to verse three, and somebody shout out the labels. I see two of them in my translation, NRSV. What are the labels the names, if you will, that David gives this group of people in verse three. What do you guys see there? You can put that, um, Isaac, if you wanna find that verse three slide, you can put that up there for people to see too. Thank you. What are the names? Holy ones, what else? 
noble, right? Is that what I'm hearing? Holy and noble? You're, you're mumbling and grumbling this morning? Um, the holy ones, and they are noble. So David names this group of people, right? I would say that David identifies with this group of people, right? He calls them, maybe your translation says, the saints in the land, the holy ones of the land. From what I can understand, these saints, these holy people, do the same thing David did. They place their trust in God. They have relationship with him. They've experienced him to be trustworthy. And so David calls them holy. David calls them noble. He calls them saints. You can almost see verse 3 as a continuation of verses 1 and 2, right? Where verses 1 and 2, this is David and his experience and what he knows to be true. And then, he, and then he says, hey, let me show you another whole group of people who trust in God the same way I do. They're saints. They're holy. They're noble. Then there's a second group, verse 4. Do you guys see any labels in verse 4? Any names for this group of people? What does David call them? It's kind of a trick question. This one might be right up Isaiah's alley. There's, there's not really a label, is there? Or the, lab, or the label is those who choose another God. This is like a five-word label, right? <laughs> or a four-word label. Like he doesn't even identify them. The first group are saints. They're holy. They're noble the second group, he just uses this term, those, <laughs> those people. And I, the point I'm trying to make is not that David is divisive. That, that's, that's to maybe miss the mark here a little bit. But I find it interesting that David connects with and identifies with this first group, and he does not identify with the second group. He, he actually rejects this group of people. Because this group of people place their trust in something else, in someone else. They think there are other gods and that those gods can, can be trusted. Now, there may have, in fact, been other gods, depending on the context, when this was written, to whom it was written, all the, all the nations, the pagan nations around the nation of Israel, they were worshiping other gods, to be sure, but none of them can be trusted. None of them have proven their trustworthiness like God has over and over again. And so David is like, those people who continue to place their trust in those things, like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna have anything to do with them, right? David was king, so he functioned in kingly ways for the nation of Israel. So he, he would have helped with temple sacrifice. He would have pronounced judgments on his people. So that's, that's where the text says, David says, I'm, I'm not gonna have anything to do with their offerings. Like I'm not, I'm not even gonna listen to, I'm not even gonna put their names on my lips. They're those people. This is a stark contrast to the group David belongs to. John Calvin has this to say about this group of people. Those who chase after other gods are like those who would forsake the fountain of living water and hew their own cisterns which hold no water. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Like if God is the fountain of life, these people are are turning their backs on the fountain of life, making their own pot, making their own holder of water, and it's got holes in it. Then they fill it with water and expect it, assume that the pot, the cistern, is going to work the way the cistern was designed to work. It's not. They reject the fountain of life and try to create their own thing. This, I see so much truth in this for my life. Maybe you could say the same when we're more self-reliant than God-reliant. David doesn't identify with this group of people. He identifies with the group in verse three. Then we get to verse five. Uh, David returns to his original statement. He refers to a portion and a cup. This is perhaps the most famous verse or couple of verses in this 
uh, particular psalm. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup you hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. Okay, I will ask for your participation here. Um, Portion and cup are the two words I want us to think about really well for just a few minutes. Can someone give us a definition of the word portion? You don't have to think too hard. You're probably going to be right. What's a good definition of the word portion? Raise your hand and shout it out. Micah. A serving, excellent. Yes, you are correct. Very good. Who, who else would add to that? Yeah, Wyatt. A part. Yep, very good. A serving or a part. How else would we describe portion? Any other nuance there? Anything to add? How many of you, when you hear the word portion, immediately think of pie? Anybody? Raise your hand. Anybody? Me. I, that's what I did. I thought of pie. Uh, I think of that as a portion, right? The bigger piece of pie or the smaller piece of pie. Now, I don't know if this is true in your home or not, but in my home, when we get to divide things, primarily with a knife, my kid, all my kids volunteer for that right? I'll cut. I want to cut. I want to, I want it, right? Because they're grabbing at control because they know they can, they can skew it in their favor, right? Like they can, if I have the knife, I can control who gets the bigger piece of pie. So all of them, oh, we're going to cut this pie up. Who wants to do it? Me, 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 me. All four hands go up, right? Danielle's three. She doesn't even know what she's doing. Her siblings are raising her hand, so, so she's raising her hand, right? They, she doesn't know what she's doing. All of them want to volunteer, and then Lisa and I say this, Okay, okay, any of you can cut, but whoever cuts gets the last choice. Any of you guys ever do that? Then where do their hands go? <laughs> From here to, whoo, I don't want to do anything. Nope, I'm just going to wait. I'm going to wait. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back here because I want the first choice of the biggest portion. That's what David is saying here. The Lord is my chosen portion. What he means by this is is his share of the goods or his share of the land. When David writes this, he's inviting all the Israelites to remember the promises that God gave their ancestors. And let's be clear, when David writes this, they're eating the biggest piece of the pie right now. Like David is king, All their enemies are not attacking. They have a united kingdom under David and under God. Like, these are some of the best years in the life of the Israelites. Like, all the promises God gave their ancestors are coming true. They've received the promised land with all of its milk and honey. They get the grain. They get the olive fields. They get the grape, the the olive trees and orchards, the, the grape vineyards. All of those things they have, they're eating the biggest piece of the pie right now. And David wants to remind them these were promised to our ancestors and they didn't get it. They got the small piece of pie. We, right now, have the big piece of pie. And David is saying all of these things have come true right now. Israelites, can you see this? David goes farther to say that you, God, are my portion. So big piece or little piece or somewhere in the middle, David says, you can have all the pieces. I have my portion. His name is God. Right? The kind of trust, the kind of relationship that that takes, even in bounty, even in blessing, God says, David says, God is my portion. I don't think we need a definition for cup, but I think it's really important to think about cup or lot in this text. God is also David's cup. And that means somebody's destiny, right? To cast lots is a biblical thing to do, uh, to, to make a decision, to discern the Holy Spirit, um, to use like, like common terms like, uh, this is the hand I've been dealt. That's essentially what David is saying here. Like, you gotta, you gotta play these cards because this is the hand you've been dealt. This is your life. This is your cup. It's your destiny, 
You can think of it in, uh, in terms of time. So not only is David's portion in the hands of God, this is David's right now, um, but also David's cup, this is his future. David's future is in the hands of God. The lines have fallen, David says. The inheritance has been secured. Even though I don't have it yet, says David, I believe it, I trust it, I know it to be true. God, D- David's now is in the hands of God and David's future is in the hands of God. One more point in verse eight. I think it's really cool. God is kind of playing Houdini here, if I can say that without being sacrilegious. This is a really interesting thing. Look at verse eight. Isaac, go ahead and put verse eight up there if you have it. Follow along with me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Notice the the spatial location of God in verse eight. Where is he? Shout it out. Louder, please. Thanks, Wes. (laughs) That's my son. Um, He's at the right hand of David. Where, Where else is he? Before him. In other words, in front of him, right? Think about this. Let's try to get our human brains to think about this for two shakes. David has put God in front. It's be, we, we know this because of what he said in verse one. The Lord, I say to the Lord, you are my God. You are my Lord. It means David has already submitted himself. God is in charge, right? God is not my co-pilot. God is my pilot, David says, right? I'm along for the ride in God's story, God's life, God's journey. I, David, am a part of this. I've put God in front of me. And then, and then, by the mystery of God, by his omnipresence, somehow God, uh, David's experience of God is as if God were right beside him. Isn't that beautiful? David puts God up front. God moves to the side. Like, who does that? What leader in your life does that? What person, what God does that? Our God does that. Like it's amazing to me how God moves in this psalm. It's so cool that when David puts him up front, he experiences him as a friend, as a helper. Like, this is why he can trust, right? This is why David can say all these things. This is why David can rejoice. I've set the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. If God is before David, how can he also be at his right hand? It's like a magic trick. (laughs) It's like this weird thing that only God can do. Somehow he's in front of me and he's beside me. God, who is the object of life, becomes the comrade of living. So cool. So, so cool. This is why David can finish the psalm like he does. He goes on to say that his heart is glad, his whole being rejoices. David is not left to death. He will not see corruption because God has made known to David the path of life. As David walks down this path of life, he experiences fullness of joy, pleasures forevermore. Like, let's just make a list real fast. Let's make a list of all the things David gets because he trusts in God. Refuge, goodness, delight, his past, his present, his future are secure. He gets counsel and instruction. He won't be shaken. He's glad. He rejoices. He has fullness of joy, pleasures forevermore. To make a list of all the opposites would be real depressing. (laughs) These are the things David gets because he trusts in God. So here's, here's our question that we started with. In what do you trust? In whom do you trust? 
You know we print that on our money? In God we trust? That's an interesting thing for maybe what some would say is a post-Christian nation. We put that on our money. In God we trust. For David, the answer to the question, in whom do you trust, it was easy. He trusted in no one but God, and to trust in anyone or anything was downright foolish in David's estimation. True and solid joy in which the minds of humans may rest will never be found anywhere else but in God. So I think the message for us is is the same. Would you ask him to protect you? Would you ask him to preserve you and to keep you because he is a refuge? Would you find goodness in his presence, people of God? Would you delight in the fact that your past and your presence, your present and your future are squarely and securely in the only hands that can hold all of that? Would you rejoice that you can receive counsel and instruction by that kind of God? Would you rejoice that you won't be shaken even when you are shaking? Even when you do face trials and loss and sorrow and struggle, even then you will not be shaken because your trust is in God. You'll experience gladness and rejoicing and pleasure and life. Who but God, right? Who but God can give us that kind of assurance? Who but God can do these things? And for that, we are glad. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray. God, I love how you move. It's so clear to see in a text like this how you move towards us. I'm reminded of something Pastor Brian says often, that your primary position is for us. Oh, God, I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful that you are for me and for us and for this world that you've created. God, help us like David to trust you. Not because we know that when we trust you, we get all these things, but simply because, like David, you are our portion. God, you are enough. Just you is enough to trust. So God, help us to do that today and each day. We pray in Jesus' name and all who agreed said, amen.